Ladies and gentlemen, we are not worthy of this interview today. On the phone right now, I have a rock and roll icon, the master of shock rock himself, super duper, Mr. Alice Cooper. Alice, how's it going, buddy? I'm doing great. We're in Arizona, uh, sort of the, the calm before the storm. You know, we go back out on the 15th, starting in Atlantic City, and uh, we haven't done a show in a year and a half, so we can't wait to get out there. Oh, yeah, but Phoenix is a great place to be, though, man. I went there just a few years back, and, oh, the mountains out there are beautiful. Oh, yeah, it's great, and all the golf courses are open. Actually, Phoenix is pretty wide open. I mean, everything is, uh, you know, uh, almost back to normal. It's good to hear, man. It's good to hear. And I'm really looking forward to the show up at the Appalachian Wireless Arena on October 5th. I've seen you twice now. This is going to be my third time. Third time's a charm, I guess. But one thing that I love about seeing you live is, I tell everybody this, it's not just a concert, man. Like, you put on an actual show. Not many performers do that. Like, it's so much more than just music. The fans get an entire experience with the guillotine and the electric chair, the Frankenstein, the boa constrictors. It, it's crazy. And I was wondering, where did the whole shock rock persona for you and your music and your performances start? Because there wasn't many people doing that before you came around. No, in fact, nobody was. Uh, so we, what I saw was an opportunity that rock and roll had a ton of heroes and no villains. And I just said, Alice Cooper would be a great rock villain. And so... You know, the show, that if you say to an audience, if you have a song called Welcome to My Nightmare, well, don't just say it. Give them the nightmare. And so we would spend, you know, all the extra time and money on producing a show where the audience would see the nightmare. They would actually see the bed come down on stage and the things coming off from under the bed. And it was all to the music, you know, without watering down the rock. I mean, the, I always keep a, the hardest rock band going. Uh, and, and we don't water anything down. We just we, we just totally rock and roll. But, but where do you get all these crazy ideas from? Just watching scary movies, or like, where does all this craziness come from? Well, you know, a lot of it is just, you know, a lot of it is just uh, uh, figuring out what the lyrics are talking about. And I've always found that horror and comedy are very close together. Hmm. And then you add hard rock to that. And you can have a lot of fun up on that stage. You know, I mean, yeah, you, you know, an illusionist always sets you up to, you think something's going to happen and something else happens. Well, that happens a lot, a lot in our show. You know, you, you think that Alice is going to do one thing and he does the other, and then you go, oh, he got me, you know. Yeah. So, but, but the guillotine and all that, that's all very rehearsed. I mean, it's like uh, we have to make sure that it all fits with the music. And the music comes first, uh, we spent eight hours on the music and one hour on the theater. That is crazy. I, I've, Like I said, I've seen you twice, and the last time I was pretty close to the stage. And the way y'all do that guillotine is just fascinating to me. How close does that actually come to hitting you, man? Because the first time I've seen you, I'm like, oh, they just killed Alice. Uh, the, the, the guillotine, for one thing, if, he, if anybody out there thinks that that's a foam rubber blade, that's a 40-pound steel blade. And it misses me by eight inches. Oh, my God. That is <laughs> so crazy. It does look real. Yeah, it looks very, the, the closer the blade gets, the more real it looks. And so we have it, you know, I mean, it's just one of those things that you you keep, you do it and, until it's absolutely perfect. And then, yeah, you know, you, you know it's going to work every night. You hope it's going to work every night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, I mentioned the uh, boa constrictors earlier. You always come out on stage with your boas. And I learned getting ready for this interview that all the boa constrictors that you've ever used have a name. And you get pretty creative with them. Uh, two of my favorites that I was reading about is uh, Count Strangula and my personal favorite, Cobra Winfrey. I thought that that was both genius and hilarious. What's the What's the name of the boa constrictor on this tour? Oh, uh, we have uh, well, we have uh, Boa Derek, and uh, we have Julius Squeezer. Ah, I like that. I like that. <laughs> well, whenever I was reading about you at these boa constrictors, man, I also seen, and you can't believe everything you see on the internet, so I didn't know if this was true, but did you lose one of the boa constrictors in Knoxville, Tennessee one time? Is that story true? Yeah, it's absolutely true. Uh, boa constrictors like to swim, you know, so yeah. I filled, filled up the bathtub, 
and I close the door and she likes to swim around, you know, all night. And I open the door the next morning in the bathroom and she's gone. Oh, no, she's about she's about four inches thick. She's not going going under the door. She went down the toilet. Whoa. And she went into the plumbing of the hotel. Right. And two weeks later, she came up in Charlie Pride's toilet. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if he was sitting on the toilet at the time or if he was shaving, but he looked over and there's this, you know, 12 foot boa constrictor <laughs> coming out of his toilet. Uh, that would have been that would have been the, my most religious moment if I was him. Yeah, <laughs> if I was using the toilet that time and I looked down I'm like, man, what did I eat? Yeah, you go, oh, wow. That was, <laughs> was that Chinese food? I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, it, it, it's an honor to speak with you today, man. And I have to take this opportunity to ask you, of course, about Wayne's World. I'm a 90s baby. That's one of my favorite movies growing up. I grew up listening to your music. And it's just it's awesome whenever movies and music collide in such a beautiful way. To me, you have one of the best cameo scenes in movie history. What's the story behind you working on Wayne's World? How did you get involved with that movie? Well, you know, uh, they called me up, you know, and uh, they said, uh, we really need you for this part in the movie. Then we're not. We're, I've seen them do that bit before on, on Saturday Night Live. So Michael says, uh, do you want to do it? I went, yeah, of course I want to do it. So we came in. And I was supposed to just do the song. And then when I got there, they, you know, Wayne says, well, I mean, uh, Michael says, well, you're an actor. He says, I have some lines for you. Okay. And I went, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to do lines. So, you know, I've got all this dialogue, and he has me about eight pieces of paper, and it's all this dialogue on it. And I go, well, when are we shooting this? And he goes, about half an hour. <laughs> so I had to learn all this stuff about Miliwake and all this stuff. And halfway through it, I realized I couldn't remember it, so I just started making things up. <laughs> you know, and, and it sounded, though, like I was a, a contestant on Jeopardy!, you know, because I was so smart about all this stuff. And that was the joke about it. Well, here's all these rock stars that are absolute geniuses. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're like uh, talking about the politics and the, you know, uh, all this. Uh, uh, that was the funny part of it. So it worked. I mean, uh, Mike and Dana thought it was really funny. And it, it, it ended up being sort of the signature uh, of that movie. Oh, yeah, man. Whenever you say, yes, Pete, it is. Dude, that kills me oh, every yeah. single time. <laughs> well, yeah, here's this guy with tattoos everywhere. And he says, that's an Algonquin word, isn't it? Why, yes, Pete, it is. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome, man. Another cameo of yours in a movie that I think is just as great is the one that you did with Johnny Depp, Dark Shadows. To me, that is one of like Tim Burton's most underrated great films like i encourage everybody to go check that movie out what brought you back to the big screen for that role in dark shadows as the cooper woman well for you know for one thing johnny's a real buddy of mine you know in fact he plays guitar in the hollywood vampires my other band yeah him and joe perry are the two guitar players and uh i met him on the set and they said we needed a really iconic character from that era to, to, you know, because they're going back to 1972 in this. And I went, okay, great. It'll be fun. So, you know, doing that thing with Tim Burton, that was another reason I wanted to do it, because I wanted to work with Tim Burton. And the, and the movie was very funny. I mean, it had its moments. It had its really dark, scary moments. But Johnny made the movie very funny. You know, uh, he was this, this, you know, this vampire that's totally out of 200 years behind he doesn't know what a television is. He doesn't know what Alice Cooper is. He doesn't know what a rock band is. And so he's going on, you know, his life in, in 1790 instead of <laughs> the year that it's in, you know. So, I mean, it was very funny how, how the whole thing turned out. And we ended up being best friends then after that. Yeah, I was going to ask if, if that movie kind of led to you and Johnny and Joe all creating the Hollywood vampires. Because y'all done that like after the movie, right? Yeah, it was. We, uh, you know, I knew that, first of all, I knew that Johnny was a great guitar player. He wasn't just an actor trying to be a, a rock star. He was in a band before he was an actor. And he was a guitar player. So I heard him play before, and I went, you know, this guy is, is the real deal. In fact, right now he's working with Jeff Beck. You know, so, I mean, uh, that you don't work with Jeff Beck unless you're the best player around. And, 
so Johnny, you know, we put this band together and said, let's just be a bar band. Let's just go, you know, play bars and uh, do cover songs. And it ended up, we did one, one tour, one single show, Duff McKagan on bass and, you know, everybody like that. And the very next show was at Rock and Rio, 250,000 people. <laughs> so we went from a bar band to the biggest audience you could get in, in two days. <laughs> but I, y'all do an incredible job, though, man. Like your uh, your cover of Heroes, David Bowie's Heroes, to me, that's one of the best yeah. covers out there, man. And Johnny, he's got a voice on him, too. Like not only is he a great guitar player, but you wouldn't think Johnny to sound that good. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, as the funny thing was, I had to talk him into it. You know, he said, I want to do Heroes by Bowie. And I said, great. And he says, so uh, this is how it goes. And I went, well, you're going to sing it. And he goes, no, 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 I can't sing. I said, Johnny, you did Sweeney Todd, the movie True. Sweeney Todd. True. I said, which is which is a an opera. You sang the whole thing. And he goes, oh, yeah, I did, didn't I? <laughs> so, <laughs> the great thing about that song was we were in Germany, touring in Germany, uh, the Vampires was. And it ended up, I, you know, we recorded that song in the same studio that Bowie recorded it. In, oh, in that's Berlin. cool. That's cool. Yeah, so we thought it was a nice tribute to Bowie, and uh, you know, we did it live in the studio. I mean, we didn't do section after section; we just did the whole song live. But that band is so good; you could, you could, they could, we could do live tra- tracks like that, and it sounds like uh, it sounds like we produced it. But really, that's just the band playing live. Yeah, man, y'all absolutely killed it. That's one of my favorite cover tunes. But I wanted to also uh, take time to ask you about your faith, too, because that's one fun fact about you that blew my mind was how much of a Christian man you are. I think that's awesome, but to be completely honest, Alice, you were one of the last people on earth that I expected to be a man of God and changing your life. And But like I said, I think that, that is a wonderful thing that you've done. But how did that part of your life come about? Like, you playing with Hollywood vampires and being the shock rock that icon that you are to being the man of God. How did all that happen? Well, I think that, you know, there was, I, I grew up in the church. My dad was a pastor and my grandfather was an evangelist. My wife's dad is a Baptist pastor. So I grew up in the church and then I became, you know, uh, I went as far away as you could, you know, and then came back. When I got sober, uh, all my friends were dying. I mean, you know, Jim Morrison and Jimi Hendrix and, Janis Joplin, all, all the people I drank with were all dead. And I started throwing up blood at one point. And so I went in the hospital. And when I came out, I, and I was not a cured alcoholic. I was a healed alcoholic, which means God took it away from me. I mean, mm. I never had to go to AA. I never had to have a sponsor. I never had uh, anything. The doctor says, do you have a sponsor? And I said, no, I have a savior, which mm. is much better. <laughs> and... So, you know, but the great thing about it was I, I think God put me in a position of saying, look, you're a rock singer. Be a rock singer. But follow me. He, he mm-hmm. never said, hey, by the way, rock music doesn't make I hate rock music. He said, no, go ahead and be a rock singer. But follow me. And, you know, when you write your songs, think of me. And, I, and almost all of my songs either point to Christ or point away from Satan. That's awesome, man. And I think, too, that you can serve as a great role model to your fans out there because so many people look at the rock and roll lifestyle as, like you said, you know, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and unfortunately, often, all times, die early death. So, I mean, whenever it comes to you as a role model to your fans, I mean, you can actually be saving lives by telling this story that you are. Well, and and at the same time, I mean, I I tell them, look, I don't know one rock star that ever went through a drug problem or an alcohol problem and said, Oh, what a good idea. We were, we, we actually proved that it doesn't work, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, and so I know that young bands get out there and, 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 and the good thing to know is that most bands now, and I would say 90% of the bands are not druggies or, or and they might drink beer. They might drink some wine, but very few real professional touring bands, are into any drugs at all. So if any young band out there thinks that's true, I mean, look at Guns N' Roses, look at Aerosmith, look at Alice Cooper. We've all been through it and luckily came out the other end, or not luckily, I mean, that was God's plan. 
But at the same time, we all could have died easily, all of us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's very true, man. And I'm so thankful that you were able to overcome all of that and you're still out there rocking shows like you're going to be doing up at the Appalachian Wireless Arena on October 5th. Everybody go get those tickets today. And Alice, thank you so much for this, man. It was an absolute honor. Thank you, too. And we can't wait to get there. It'll be fun.